New dip sockets, shitty old camera. Uh, this isn't actually a shitty old camera. Uh, it's a very nice camera. It's a Canon EOS M from uh, the mid 2010s. And uh, I've used it a lot for more cinematic stuff. It can shoot raw video. But the 1080p mode in it, which is what I was using for that last Quantar video, uh, is not the best and is really showing its age. So I switched things up a little bit. I'm using my iPhone. Uh, believe it or not, the camera on the iPhone is actually uh, surprisingly good. I can shoot at uh, a true 1080p, 30 frames per second, and uh, in my opinion, it looks much better. So we're going to stick with this for now and see how well it ends up working out in the long run. So what's the game plan for today? Remove the crusty old socket, replace it with a uh, theoretically not-so-crusty socket, uh, fire the thing back up, and uh, fingers crossed, uh, that's the only problem. It powers back up, works just fine, and uh, continues to work for the next 20 years. So a smarter man probably would have bought a uh, actual chip puller tool, because they're only like five bucks. But I have never claimed to be a smarter man. So we're going to use this uh, case opening spudger. Hope I don't bend the, uh, the pins on there too badly. I think that's all right. We're going to give that a shot. Let's do it. Now there are much, much better ways to do this. Uh, solder wick would be one of them. Uh, the more destructive option would be to just uh, cut the thing off and then uh, individually remove all the leftover pins. And that might be the route we take if this ends up uh, failing horribly, but I've got the hat air gun, and this is the fastest way that I can think of to get it done. And because I'm lazy, the fastest way is the way we're going to go with. The big thing I'm concerned about is uh, accidentally moving uh, other components out of the way or out of where they're supposed to be. So I think I'm actually going to grab a pair of tweezers here and uh, make sure I lift that as straight up as I can so that I don't jostle anything around it. Nope. That's... Not even loose. It's a pretty thick and beefy multi-layer PCB, so it's probably gonna take a while to get the heat into all those pads. And I've got my makeshift aluminum foil shield here just to make sure that uh, the heat only goes where I want it to, and like I said, I don't wanna disrupt any of the uh, small little SMD components. I can put them back if they get moved out of the way, but I'd rather not. I can see some of the pins are already uh, liquid. Oh, oh, we almost got it. We almost got it. Oh, come on. She wants to come up. Oh, that left side's totally loose now. There we go. Beautiful. That was relatively painless. Just cleaning up the pads here a little bit. Not strictly necessary, but uh, it's probably going to make it a little easier to solder to uh, when I go to put the new one in, so might as well. You can definitely tell either this is a lead-free solder or uh, the board is sucking a lot of the heat out of my uh, soldering tip. So I got the iron set to 360 Celsius, and uh, it's taken a fair bit of time to uh, get the solder melted on each of these pads. So yeah, like I said, could be, uh, could be lead free, could also be just a thick ass board. I'm running out of solder wick, trying to uh, conserve it as much as I can there, but uh, she's all uh, tapped out and that's not going to focus worth a damn. Oh well. 
And like I said, I probably don't need to be doing this. Um, it's just going to make my life a little bit easier. The the new dip socket's going to sit nice and flush on there. If there's not a bunch of uh, you know rounded big solder blobs on these pads. So I'm not being crazy super anal about any of this, but uh, just got the decent amount of the solder off of those and uh, should be good to go. Just going to hit it with a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol there. Try and uh, pretty it up a bit. Make it theoretically a little bit better in the long run. Don't have a bunch of flux residue there. Uh, corroding stuff over time, even though it should be no clean flux, but eh, we'll see. And put some uh, fancy overpriced uh, MG chemicals, no clean flux. Because I got it on hand and, uh, you know, it doesn't do me any good just sitting there on the shelf. So just put a nice little splash of that on each side. Help things flow nicely. Might as well. We'll go ahead and throw down the new uh, dip socket. Looks like it's going to be uh, maybe not a perfect match, but good enough. It's going to fit on those pads and uh, doesn't look like it's going to run into anything. I might... Mm, I'm debating if I want to trim up the uh, ends a little bit. They stick out over top of the pads and they get a little close to some of those test points. Mm, it's a lot of extra work though. I don't know. We're just going to do... We're going to give it a haircut here. Make sure to, uh, you know, trim this directly over the exciter so we get all that nice FOD dripping down into the, uh, oh, all the different, you know, very sensitive RF components on this thing. Make sure we get it nice and messed up so we can never actually figure out what the real fault is behind it. Um, actually, the flux that I put on those pins is acting as a very nice uh, little adhesive to keep all the uh, little metal bits from flying all over the workbench there, so that's handy. Definitely not a uh, manufacturer recommended procedure here. Same exact thing on the other side, just shortening things up a little bit so it uh, fits better. And there we go. One uh, dip socket, a little bit narrower. And I'm going to approach this just like I would soldering, uh, you know, a microcontroller. I'm going to tack it down with a, a single pin on one side here. So actually what we'll do is we will take uh, and put just a little bit of solder on uh, oh this pin right here. And go ahead and you can't see a single thing I'm doing. What a shame. Yeah, something like that. And then look around and make sure uh, it lines up with all the other pins on there. I could probably I could probably do a little bit better job than that, but I'm not going to. There we go. So that's not going to move too much left and right. I'm going to go ahead and put solder on the rest of the pins and uh, see if it helped. All right, change of scenery. I had to move you guys out of the way. I don't know how those uh, YouTubers do it. You know, the camera seems to be uh, always right where you want to be. And uh, if, if it's not, the shot is terrible. So, uh, I don't know. Hopefully you guys can see at least some of what I'm doing here. I mean, it's real simple stuff. Just slapping some solder down on the pins, making sure it's uh, flowing onto the pad, and that's about it. The flux is helping, you know. I'm just gobbing solder on there and uh, hoping it makes good contact. Can't be any worse. And I'm going to go back through here when the camera's not in my face and uh, make sure these are all actually soldered properly because uh, I can't see a damn thing right now. And some idiot uh, bent up these pins real badly on this side. So I went back through there with the uh, jeweler's loop and a lot of them are actually like kind of even lifted way off uh, of the board. So I'm just pressing them all down here and uh, making sure they're going to make a good solder joint. There's plenty of solder on the pads. The... Uh, the pins were just sticking three miles up in the air, so uh, it's real hard to make a solder joint under those kind of conditions. We'll go ahead and do the idiot check, just to make sure uh, that I didn't create more problems for myself here. So, go ahead and throw the uh, multimeter back into continuity mode, and just like in the last video, I'm gonna 
measure continuity between all these pins. And as an added bonus, there's now a nice thick layer of uh, flux residue preventing the uh, multimeter from uh, making good contact. I'm going to go ahead and clean that off before I keep going down this road. There's probably a better way to clean PCBs, but uh, I don't know what it is. All right, exciter chips back in. Once again, for oh the third or fourth time, we will uh, check that continuity. And that is the questionable uh, VCC pin that we were having all the problems with in the last episode. I could just barely, barely touch that and get good continuity, which is a far, far different result from what we were getting last time. I think we're ready to power the thing up. So same setup as the last video. I've got uh, 14 and five volts uh, ready to pipe in. And I got the scope probe on that reset line. Uh, the LEDs to watch out for are down here. Not sure how well those are gonna show up on the camera, but uh, Let's not waste any time. Let's get this thing powered up and see if I fixed it. Here we go. <gasps> I think we might have done it. We've got a, a single red light, which is how the exciter normally starts up with the, uh, that's the PA fail light. Uh, no other lights are on. Markedly different from uh, before we replaced that socket. And uh, I can touch that thing all day and it doesn't change the behavior of the LEDs one bit. So I'm gonna say we fixed this. And uh, I'm pretty surprised that we fixed it. I was almost positive there was going to be some kind of deep hidden issue beyond just the uh, EEPROM socket going bad. But, uh, well, I shouldn't speak too soon, but I think it's fixed. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring the chassis back up from the basement, plug this thing in, and uh, fire the whole bit up again and see if it uh, works any better. This thing is large. I don't know if you knew that. Got the uh, exciter all buttoned up here. Uh, all those bodge wires are desoldered, and uh, I got my fingers crossed that there are a bunch of little metal bits inside ready to uh, short the whole thing out as soon as I turn it on. But only one way to find out, I suppose. So we'll get this thing slotted in and power it up. I feel like we need some dramatic music for this occasion. I've got everything buttoned backed up. I've got the uh, really annoying a uh, little coax jumper that goes between the exciter and the amplifier back in place. Uh, I do not have it hooked up to a dummy load right now, which I probably should, just in case it decides to randomly transmit. It has been known to do that in the past. Are you ready? Here we go. Excellent! I can't tell you how relieved seeing all green lights makes me. Uh, the flashing light there for the V24 modem is because uh, I don't currently have the uh, V24 adapter hooked up. Uh, that would plug into a, uh, well, it's missing the cutout, but it would plug into a RJ45 right there, and that's how you uh, link these things together into things like the uh, Pi Star reflectors. But the exciter appears to be working. We have a good TX lock. We don't have all the LEDs on like before. We don't have any other fail lights. I think I fixed it. And I'm as surprised as you are. Now that we got this thing up and running, and it at least seems to be functioning properly, I guess the logical next step would be to fire up the service monitor, put the repeater on it, run it through its paces, make sure it's putting out the right amount of power, make sure it's on frequency, all that good stuff. And uh, if it all checks out, we'll send it back out to the wild and hopefully we don't see it back on the bench for a long time. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.